Welcome to Tea with Our Ping. Have you heard of Qin Shi Huang, the emperor who united China? How about Kublai Khan, the mighty Mongolian warrior who invaded China and established the Yuan Dynasty? Or perhaps the Qing Emperor Kangxi, the great patron of the arts? Each of these powerful men advanced Chinese civilization in a different period of history. And they each came from a ruling family or noble clan as per China's dynastic tradition, which lasted for thousands of years until the 20th century. The great emperor I want to introduce today is a man who lived many centuries earlier, between 2334 and 2234 BC. He was born with the name Shun. Shun would become known as one of China's five legendary sage kings. The great historian Sima Qian wrote about him in Shi Ji, or Records of the Great Historian. So his story is one that future Chinese emperors like Qin Shi Huang of the Qin Dynasty, Kublai Khan of the Yuan Dynasty, and Kangxi of the Qing Dynasty would all have known. But Shun began life as a poor peasant. How did this very ordinary person climb the rank to rule all of China? As a child, Shun lived on a farm with his father stepmother, and half-brother. In fact, his whole family couldn't stand their eldest son. They even tried to kill him unsuccessfully on multiple occasions. But despite his abusive family, Shun never stopped being filial to both his parents, and was always caring towards his younger brother. He would happily do anything they asked of him. It was said that the family couldn't kill Shun when they wanted to. Yet when they needed him, he was always around. He was an extraordinary person even from a young age. When he was 17, he was driven out of the house and became homeless. So he made a living as a laborer. In fact, wherever he traveled, he proved diligent and resourceful. People liked and respected him. Shun first became apprentice in a village by the Yellow River that produced pottery. Within a year, he helped improve the standard of pottery for the whole village and won the admiration of his competitors. The village grew into a thriving city within a few years. Shun then traveled to the mountain Li to farm. Other farms want to offer him land. Shun decided to share the land with others, so the whole community could grow crops. At Lake Zhe, Shun became a skilled fisher and he quickly learned where the best fishing parts of the river were, but he would always leave those to others. He never take the best spot for himself. After Shun joined them, the intense infighting among the fishermen stopped. Miles away in the capital Pingyang, which would be in modern-day Shanxi province, Emperor Yao, a wise and benevolent ruler, was looking for his successor. He had nine sons, but he realized that none of them had the virtue to inherit his throne. So he sent out his ministers to find a worthy candidate who had what it would take to become the next ruler. His ministers suggested Shun. After Shun was brought to court, Emperor Yao decided to test him. He let Shun marry his two daughters along with a house and dowry and gave him a district to govern. This may sound strange today, but Polygamy was normal practice at that time. At 30 years old, you might think Shun had hit the jackpot, but instead of riding off into the sunset to live the good life, he continued to work in the field every day and even convinced the two princesses to join him in living a humble life in the countryside. Shun's own family saw his success and became enraged. His half-brother lured him into a barn and tried to burn him alive. On another occasion, Shun's stepmother asked him to dig a new well for the family. That's when they tried to bury him alive. But Shun survived, and yet never tried to blame or punish them. Now surprisingly, among the 24 most celebrated Chinese in terms of filial piety, Shun ranks number one. Towards the end of Emperor Yao's reign, Shun assumed the role of acting emperor at 50 years old. After three years, he quietly left for home so that Dan Zhu, Emperor Yao's son, could govern the country. But the public demanded Shun to continue taking care of the state affairs. So at 61, he officially became emperor and reigned compassionately for 39 years. 
Do you know why I find the story so interesting? Some ancient emperors in the West also began their lives as peasants. There was Diocletian of Rome, who rose through the ranks of the military, and Basil I, the Byzantine emperor who took power through a violent coup. But Shrin's story is different. It makes me wonder, what makes a good emperor? Shrin's life shows us the five fundamental relationships in Confucian philosophy, those between ruler and subject, father and son, elder brother and younger brother, husband and wife, and friend and friend. Chinese philosopher Mencius said, the great Shun had a still greater delight in what was good. He regarded virtue as the common property of the people. In imperial China, people believe the right to rule is granted by heaven, and heaven selects the ruler for his virtue. On Shun's reign, Mencius commented, the sovereign can present a man to heaven, but he cannot make heaven give the man the throne. Yao presented Shun to heaven, and heaven accepted him. He presented him to the people, and the people accepted him. Therefore, I say heaven doesn't speak. It simply indicates his will by his personal conduct and the conduct of affairs. Sima Qian wrote in records of the grand historian that Civilization and kindness in the world started with Shun. Before Shun's death, instead of having his own children take over the seat of power, he passed his throne to Yu, who was famed for controlling the notorious floods of the Yellow River. Yu later founded the Xia dynasty. Shun was a great man and a great emperor. But actually, he wasn't the only Chinese emperor who came from a humble background. There was also Liu Wang, who founded the Han Dynasty, and Zhu Yuanzhang, who founded the Ming Dynasty, all through armed rebellions against the previous dynasties. But none of them matched Shun in terms of virtue or filial piety. At the end of the day, Shun is known for his rule of virtue. In the words of Confucius, Shun was the sage of the virtue, thereby an esteemed son of heaven. For centuries, rule of virtue that started with Shun was a timeless golden standard for all emperors and rulers in China. Until 1949, when the foreign communist ideology took over this Middle Kingdom, historians note that some 80 million innocent lives were lost under the past 70 years of the communist rule, more than the sum of victims from both World War I and World War II put together. According to Freedom House, an independent NGO, China ranks among the worst closed societies in its 2021 Freedom in the World report. In this digital age, Chinese people sadly don't have access to international media outlets and social media platforms. In Western media, we have now learned about the horrific abuses such as the genocide in Xinjiang, forced organ harvesting from Falun Gong practitioners, demolitions of Christian churches, and imprisonment of human rights lawyers and outspoken reporters. As Confucius said, study the past if you would divine the future. Many Chinese hold that the time for returning to the rule of virtue and to our cultural heritage is long overdue. It's widely believed that the open society in Taiwan where traditional culture flourish along with a vibrant democracy should be a successful model for mainland China. Speaking of Taiwan, it's time for a tea break. And now I'm going to enjoy my high mountain tea from that treasured island. Until next time, peace and tea be with you.